Welcome to the second live stream of the day that you're probably watching. You can't hate the guy. You know, it was a fun stream. Nothing too serious, but uh, the reactions and some of the halt trading definitely made it very entertaining for anything he said. We got a lot to go over. We got some jobs data. We got GME. We got some fun crypto action that's coming to fruition right now. All that and much more on today's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Welcome back to Money Never Sleeps. I'm doing great. I just found the, the Twitter post that I was looking for. Before we get into anything, nothing we say is financial advice. Uh, we're not financial advisors. We're just a couple of guys who love doing this, talking about the market. We have another guy that's usually with us, but he'll be back hopefully next week. Um, so do your own research. Talk to your own people that you pay to do your financial advice and all that stuff. And let's just have a fun Friday to close out the week. House. We've had a really good week of shows. We've made a lot of calls. A lot of things kind of come into fruition. I think we should start with the jobs data if we're going to get all the boring stuff out of the way, right? Yep. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely boring. But at the same time, it's also not because this is going to be kind of – this could implicate what the rate decision is next week. Now, I have a very different assumption of what's probably going to happen next week than maybe some other people do. And I think I, I think that the data is bearish. It really is. However, I, I'm – of the belief of the opposite actually happening. So I'm going to get into this and pull up the chart, or actually the screen, you take a look at some of the, the data points from the jobs uh, report that we got today, unemployment report. And I completely agree with what Michael Leibowitz is saying here. I said that when I looked at the data this morning, it's the best, worst jobs report I've ever seen. And I completely agree because it is a mixed bag. It 100% is a mixed bag. Let's, let's look at just some of the stuff right here. Household survey, negative 408K establishment plus 272. This is the one that everyone's looking at right now. Uh, Full-time work is down by 625,000. However, part-time up 286,000 jobs. And then if you just look at native born to foreign uh Foreign workers in the United States, you can see that native born are down 663 foreigners, 414k. Yeah, you know, that begs the question of whether if that's a lot of people who have came over in the past few months that are finally finding work or have, they've created jobs for those people, right? It's a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a really mixed bag. You could take this either way. Unemployment came in at 4%. We said it would be coming in at 4% or higher, just kind of inched over that 3.9%. So we're in the 4% finally. Um, you know, I think with everything that we've gotten this week, it's still an extremely cooling labor market, right? Uh, it's very easy to look at this and say, oh no, it's, it's hot, but you're kind of in this weird time right now in the election year where you kind of need two things to happen. The, the fed needs to make sure that the labor market cools off in order for them to cut back rates. Right. But at the same time, you're also dealing with that. We need to make sure that the economy is strong, resilience uh, narrative so that people don't feel uh, hopeless come November, right? We need to have people think that the economy is doing great. You know, maybe there's a few layoffs, but for the most part, everything is going fine. We're still adding jobs. It shouldn't be something that you should be worried about. And that's the problem with this type of data set that we continue to get. It's really easy to make the data, you know, fit whatever narrative you want to believe in. This is one mixed bag that I think that we have to take into account everything that's happened this week, that the labor market is more on the side of cooling than it is on the side of getting hotter. I don't know if you had any opinions on that at all. No, I mean, mostly I've just been really surprised. Um, you know, we got, we got 4% unemployment rate. Um, and then, like you pointed out right in the chat, I didn't dig as deep into it, but we added more jobs, uh, 272,000, which is a pretty big increase from last month by almost 100,000. But like you pointed out to me, you know, most of those are part-time jobs, not uh, not full-time, nothing that's going to be long-lasting. So, um, you know, it's just uh, not, not really a good sign of strength, so to speak. No, not at all. And the other problem is, too, that a lot of the part-time jobs that were added were jobs that were added jobs that were taken by people who already had multiple jobs. So in other words, it's a second and third job for a lot of people with all these full-time jobs being lost kind of makes sense, right? 
that's the so it's, it's we talk about the rotation of capital this is almost like the rotation of uh trying to find capital through income and it's just like okay we just lost a full-time job i guess i'm gonna have to find another part-time job these a lot of these companies aren't necessarily willing to uh hire people full-time they're cutting hours you know that also kind of plays into that where you can easily become a full-time worker who ends up becoming a part-time worker just because your hours cut are below the you know the threshold of what's considered full-time so it's very much a mixed bag it's going to be so telling next week where the federal reserve feels the market is going i think that my base case is that we're going to see a, a rate cut either this month or the next meeting um i know that's not probably what a lot of people would expect but i think that we're seeing the front running of something across all central banks. We got it with Canada. We got it with Denmark. We got it with ECB yesterday. It just seems like if they don't do something now, they're going to point the finger at them and say that, well, you guys caused this. But if they don't get this under control in front run, whatever it might be that they see, whether it's a treasury market, maybe it's a labor market, something that I'm pretty sure with the yield curve being inverted for 24 months and uh, you know the monetary system just not creating debt and probably at a time that it needs that more than anything, there's something out there that they probably see that they need to get ahead of in order to either minimize the impact of it or to just be like, hey, guys, we did our best and then something happens, right? It's um, it's going to be one or the other. I don't know if it's going to be banks failing or something that happens overseas. It just seems like they definitely need to get ahead of it because – we're, in a, we're getting to a point where the data is now starting to point that, hey, maybe things aren't as rosy from consumer to labor market to also banks in terms of how much they're losing and hemorrhaging, especially the regional ones. Things are kind of adding up here and we're getting really close to November. Just kind of the optics I'm seeing going into uh, next week's FOMC meeting. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, we've we've kind of been talking about, you know, nothing's really been looking good in that regard. And I think, you know, Following the the lead of ECB Canada rate cuts, probably you know that that last ditch effort to get people risk on, try and stimulate the economy. So I think it'll be very telling to watch if there is a rate cut the following months and see how how do people react, right? Like, is this something that more of like we spoke on yesterday is something that stimulates institutional money and gets businesses, corporations saying, hey, you know, we can we can put a little bit more money into the market. Or is this something that drives out retail, right? Like how much is retail paying attention to this and how much do they think this counteracts rising prices as we've seen across the CPI? Absolutely. And it's, it's, I think it comes more down to institutions at that point, just because retail we know is extremely strapped. And I think it's a good way right now to segue into GameStop because it kind of plays hand in hand, right? We get these rate cuts that's a lot more faith that people probably have in the market. We're also seeing GME, which honestly a little bit off of what it did the last time in 2021. So anything can happen here, but again, we have until the 21st. I think that we saw a lot of calls today that were screwed over by how many times the trading got halted and everything was just selling off nonstop. But I think we're getting very close to the point where we could see this little rally into the OPEX. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things that are, that are lining up. I mean, we'll talk about Bitcoin in a second, but let's just pull up the GameStop chart right now. I watched the this stream. I went for a walk and I was just listening to it. So I didn't see any of the, I didn't see any chicken tendies. I heard that there was beer and I saw his reasoning for why he is bullish on GameStop. Uh, the answer to Ryan Cohen. He's very excited about Ryan Cohen and leadership. I mean, how could you not be? Uh, doesn't mean I'm going to go buy GameStop right now or get into this trade because I think it's, a fool's uh fool's journey at this point to be uh hoping <laughs> that there's a massive squeeze the thing is i do know that there are institutions behind this right now because like we said yesterday this squeeze up here limit down limit down limit down until we got to the point where we're about the 15 to 200 on the daily and the 50 and the 200 daily moving averages that's when they closed their positions and they reversed again we got some time we got a few days before we see anything uh drastic Obviously, those calls expire on the 21st. So I think he sees probably the market itself, too, because I know he's a smarter guy than he lets on. He just doesn't talk about anything else. It's a good chance that he also sees that there's going to be a bit of a run up here into this June OPEX. It's, it's a lot. It's it's funny how everything's just kind of lining up to that date. And when we see this, I'm assuming that if we're looking at this in terms of how it played out last time, we are somewhere around. Bless you. 
Thank you. I would say we're somewhere right around here. You know, I think that there's still a chance for another run up. I'm not saying the $86 or anything like that, but I do think that there is room for a squeeze if the market allows it. Today, obviously, the week, you know, the weekly close, I think it's going to be closer to that date that we see a really quick run up as opposed to anything else. Yeah, no, I think that was well put, right? Like, I only watched his stream briefly, but the difference in his personality, his demeanor, the way he speaks, acts, everything um, between his live streams and his congressional testimony, right? Where he's going deep into his research into GameStop, like step by step, why he invested, why he acted the way he did, right? He's clearly a much more, or he's capable of much more articulate, articulate speech and you know quantitative and quantitative research but yeah i think you know that's what makes him successful and popular as a streamer and content creator is he's much more nonchalant you know he's much more casual and kind of vibes similar to the wall street bets crew obviously where his, his name was made um, but yeah i think it's i think it's a good good kind of assumption that june opex we get that little spike and that's potentially where you know he decides to cash out some of those earnings um, but one thing I thought was interesting, and I don't know if this has changed since the dip from last night, but at one point, um, with the amount of calls he would have had to get the value that he had in the stocks, which was you know somewhere around like three hundred fifty million or five hundred million, he technically, if he were to exercise all those options, there were more options contracts written than GameStop stocks floating. So he would have essentially taken control of the company, which I thought was just like hilarious. Yeah, I mean, the guy was almost a billionaire last night, right? Uh, it was about nine hundred fifty-three million, I think it got to. Oh, and uh, for him, I believe it was seventy dollars made him a billionaire, and those uh, contracts, and it was at like sixty-seven, almost sixty-eight dollars. It got to. Obviously, the market didn't want that to happen. As soon as the market opened, we saw tons of volatility. The dude started to stream late, twenty minutes or so dropped even more dropped three bucks or something like that and then it was funny because every time he did talk and he wanted to show his portfolio on e-trade the dude was like all right i'm gonna show it and then trading would get halted and he couldn't show it and then he also said that uh he was gonna end the live stream right there and then gamestop took like a two dollar dump instantly and then they halted trading again but the funniest thing too was how obviously there's news around e-trade closing down his account and dude pulls out html and just like, I'll, I'll delete the E-Trade uh, logo right off your website. I'll do it right now. And he actually deletes it. And then he puts it right back on. He's like, this is just letting you guys know. Don't don't delete my account. I can start deleting things too. And he's like, I'm joking. I'm joking. Don't make me do it. Don't make me do it. Goes on for like five minutes saying that. So he, absolute wild character. Everyone was loving it. I think it was up to uh, 600, north of 600,000 people watching the stream. That's how you get retail kind of excited. I, I know not all retail. I know Cintron and probably uh, some other guys who are hoping this guy doesn't squeeze the shit out of their shorts is probably watching that too. But, you know, this is the type of thing that gets retail excited. Yeah, all I saw on Twitter for an hour and a half was Roaring Kitty, Roaring Kitty, Roaring Kitty, Roaring Kitty. You know, it, it takes your mind off things that are greater in the market. I think that's a great distraction. I don't hate him for it. I think he sees something that other people probably should have seen. We'll see how it plays out next week. Earnings are going to be important. GameStop has good earnings. Ryan Cohen has some flowery speech about how they're going to take the company somewhere. I think that could be a watch out moment. But uh, that's all I got on GameStop. Before we get into Bitcoin, let's take a one quick look at the equity market and see how things are reacting because it's a weekly close. And I just want to see how things are stacking up. You can see that right now the S&P is, I mean, it's down eight points at one point today it was at all-time highs 5373 uh let's look at nasdaq nasdaq itself you know is at all-time highs earlier today dow dow's in this weird diamond shaped pattern this is kind of a reversal pattern that's why i kind of want to keep an eye on this i think that there is going to be a summer rally maybe a little bit but it's not going to go higher than the height already i think the dow is kind of one that's telling it's also the fact that the dow doesn't have nvidia or any of those major stocks in it itself it's not going to be helpful but when we look at these major indexes the one that i think is the biggest i'm not gonna say biggest ponzi because obviously i can't i can't prove that but the one that i think is the most uh I guess not, not manipulated, but what would I say? Misleading. I would say it's definitely the most misleading when you look at its value is the S&P 500. 
A lot of that is coming from Microsoft, Apple, and NVIDIA, right? And that makes up, I think, roughly north of 15% of the entire holdings. Um, I, I think at one point it was a lot higher, if I'm not mistaken. But looking at this right here, I'm pretty sure that if NVIDIA and Microsoft, either of those two companies, take a pretty good dump, you're going to fly right through that 50 moving average, right? We could be looking towards a 200 moving average, and it'd be pretty quick, especially with how little support there is for NVIDIA. Microsoft might be able to keep it up a little bit longer than uh, you know, than you would see if it was just NVIDIA leading the market. But there, that's the problem that we have with some of these contract, or not, some of these stocks and these indexes being so highly valued. We talk about market makers and how it's problematic for market makers to provide liquidity for some of these things if there's so much uh, interest in it, right? You know, it's the same same thing with GameStop. There's not enough floating shares for him to exercise all these contracts to the point where, you know, he could cash out. He would just end up with that ownership. But when we look at NVIDIA, and this is why it's problematic, is market maker's job is to find a buyer to a seller and to make sure that that money is flowing through clearing houses, right? If this gets to the point where you're just, I mean, it's easy to find a buyer to a seller when the stock's going up. Obviously, people are willing to pay a premium for a stock's value if they think it's going to go up higher. But when it's going down lower, if no one's there to bid that thing, you are pretty much dishing out a ton of market cap to make sure that the stock is, you know, fairly valued. In that case, if this drops from say 1250 down to 969, if there's no buyers in between this area, then the price is going to keep going down until it finds, you know, buyers. And that's kind of the scary thing right now, because when you have no support, those buyers are probably going to be there around support where they're going to swoop in. No one's going to want to buy a falling knife. And that's the thing that's problematic with NVIDIA here, because if we're looking at support, it's about 967. If you want to say there's some slight support, major support remains down here right around uh, this 340 to 383 and maybe some support around 500. Um, but in between that, if you're trying to get a bid on a falling stock, I don't think you're going to see any one bite. Um, Maybe at those support levels, but it's some pretty good drops. Let's just take a quick look at this real quick, and then we go into crypto. But from here down to maybe the support level 973, that's a 23% drop. I mean, that's that's a massive dump. Go in between here uh, down to this 500 level, it's 33%. And then from this 500 level down to this 380, 340 level, I mean, that's 32% in itself. So that's just something we're going to have to keep an eye on. Um, Stock can only get so big before at some point something happens to it. And obviously people take profit. Maybe too many people take profit because they're scared that uh, scared in the future of this thing. But uh, just something I wanted to talk about because I think it's always important to see that. The other thing that we also talked about recently is the VIX probably coming down to uh, a lower support level within this bull flag. And it looks like it put in a pretty good low today down around 1207. I think by the time we get to June OPEX, there's a good chance we could see the VIX somewhere around 10. Um, I think there could be a, a couple of good days of crushes, especially if you get that rate cut. You get that rate cut on next Wednesday, I believe, that thing's getting crushed. Um, it just seems like it would. The market would be so excited to start pricing things in. You would see a lot of these indexes like the S&P, maybe the NASDAQ, not necessarily the Dow, go back to all-time highs, and it would seem like nothing could break this market one bit. So just kind of highlighting things that we're seeing, not necessarily uh, any plays I'm making. I think if I do make any plays, it's going to be on that June OPEX date for the future. Probably when people are not expecting the market to do a certain thing, I think that's when you're going to find the most value. But, you know, obviously I'll say that what I'm, I'll be doing when I actually do it. But uh, just that was all that we needed to really cover in TradFi. I think it's going to be a very exciting week next week. Um but before that, we have obviously have the weekend. So let's go into Bitcoin, and or should we start with Ethereum? You you make the call. Um, I think either they're kind of doing the same thing with ETH, obviously a little little bit accelerated percentage wise. Um, but kind of like we were talking yesterday, you know, we're we're getting that two to three percent pullback on Bitcoin, four to five percent on ETH. Um, right. And I think it's it's mainly just to test the support around 68,000 on Bitcoin, um, which it started to get close to about 68 flat, uh, maybe stopped around the 200s, but now it's holding closer to 69K. So I think this is kind of expected, at least from our, our ends, uh, as we were talking about yesterday. But 
I think this is this is leading up to potentially a big boost Monday, right? If we can hold the support here, I think uh, I think we maybe chop through the weekend, and then come Monday we see a pretty a pretty nice game. Absolutely, completely agree. I thought that we would have gotten this post market close. Uh, came a little bit early, um, but that doesn't mean that Sunday night, you know, weekly close. That could just be the rocket ship where we start to see this start to move to the upside, right? Into Monday. I, I just don't see the market, the crypto market, having any major pullbacks anytime the TradFi market is open, just for these next few weeks. Um, that just seems to be the behavior of it. And, you know, we kind of called this yesterday and the day before, and it seems like it's coming to fruition. Let's see how it plays out Sunday night. But um, just looking at these charts, obviously, this is a pretty good pullback, two and a half percent or so, a little bit more than two and a half percent for Bitcoin. Looks like it found a little it dipped a little bit lower than that. Maybe people are starting to buy in. Um, let's take a look at ETH. ETH obviously had a bigger wick to the downside. Let's see what this was earlier today. It's like 3840. Yeah, so it's about a, at one point about 6.23 percent dump from uh, the high of today. So definitely some movement there right um let's take a look at the greater alt market and see how that's performing you know cardano that's a fun candle right there for cardano that's uh down 3.19 percent matic oh my goodness matic taking a big shit i didn't see that one earlier did you 65 yeah. cents bro that was up at 75 cents a few days ago wild yeah. i mean i mean today 73 cents, 74 cents almost. So yeah, I mean, at one point it was down to 61. It's uh, it's it's trying to hang in there. So it's it's a little bit problematic here, I think, for some of these alts. I, I don't think that all of them are going to perform poorly, but when you get something like this, you can definitely see there is some weakness across the board in some of these. Maybe just because of market cap, maybe some liquidity. Um, some of these structures yeah, I mean, too, I don't like for alts. That's the thing between between some of the bigger and more mature. EVM L2s and I guess AVAX is technically an EVM compatible L1, but they're all down between eight and ten percent. Between AVAX, Optimism, Arbitrum, Matic, all all down pretty pretty heavily. Absolutely, I know uh, we talk about Crypto Capo sometimes on the show. I thought he was, you know, pretty smart guy. I appreciate his insight. You know, I'd rather have someone's insight than not have their insight in terms of their assessment of the market. He seem saying seemingly says that June might be bullish for altcoins. It's possible. I'm not saying that in any way because none of these patterns have necessarily been broken. Matic is the only one I just I saw that you know we're trading a little bit below that pattern. But when we look at something like AVAX, like this is still trading in a bull flag and a bear flag, 100%. But it doesn't mean that it can't go up to you know this height, right? It really depends on the rotation of capital, if there are bullish conditions, and if people get excited enough to start deploying capital into some of these projects outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and Solana. I should put at that point too. But, uh, you know, this wick below it and it's right back in and it's trading. So it's, see how this closes. You know, I think that's, let's see this one. Uh, that's funny. Uh, Link doing some crazy shit here. It's back in this channel. So it looks like this could have been a bit of a fake out, but it could also just be another push to the upside. Uh, let's take a look at total three. Yeah, see, this is this is my problem across the board. It seems bullish for a lot of these alts, but there's still these pet there's a lot of these patterns that we're kind of trading in, right? This is kind of a shitty one. This might be even a triangle, which is not necessarily the most bullish of patterns itself. Let's see if we can find it. There it is. Yeah, that might be a parallel channel or it could be a ascending triangle. Um, probably need the weekend and next week to see. I would say Wednesday probably be a good assessment. But it seems like a lot of these things are putting in higher highs and higher lows. We know that's not always the most bullish of circumstances, that there is probably some pullback. I mean, if I have to even pull up the Matic chart, this is kind of what we're talking about. You know, obviously it broke back into it, but then it broke out of it. And then it came down to almost the origin of where this was at 58 cents. So when I'm looking at the alt market, I do think that there is going to be a bounce, but I don't necessarily know long-term if there's going to be the strength. I, I honestly think that if you look at something like Bitcoin right now, there's a better chance of this going to an all-time high and I don't know about ETH. I don't know if ETH is going to go to an all-time high. That might be a little bit of a stretch unless tons of money comes in and pushes this up to you know north of 4,800. But it seems like those might be the ones that perform extremely well, and the other ones might be hit or miss depending on how well the others perform. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Let's pull up the, the coin glass chart real quick on funding rates to see how the market is reacting to some of this pullback. 
Okay. So not necessarily as red and positive. Some exchanges, obviously, so some of the smaller ones that maybe don't necessarily matter as much, but the bigger volume ones definitely are seeing uh, a bit of a reversion from what we saw yesterday. They're going back into the white, into the green. It's a good chance you might see that change over the weekends, and then you know once the market starts to bounce a little bit, if it does bounce, there's a good chance we could start to see it be red again. I think that come June OPEX, we're probably going to see red across the board, max longs, but that's just what we're seeing on the funding rates. Let's take a look at the liquidations to see how that's stacking up, and then we can finish wrap it up for today. Let's go to Bitcoin. Let's go to the seven day. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what we talked about yesterday, right? Yeah, it looks like either a lot of people closed positions or got got wiped out. So oh we're, yeah, we're down quite a bit from that seventy one k mark at this point, and there was. I mean, a few billion dollars every thousand thousand dollar denominator down. Yeah, it's a good liquidation. There was that gap, and it. I mean, there was a possibility that it just skipped it and pushed up. But I think by doing this, now you're going to get see a lot of people that are opening longs too. And that's the game of you know liquidations. They're just going to run them back and forth. Wherever there's gaps, people will fill them. If you move the price too far to one side, and then you just take them out on the other side, right? Something that people don't necessarily know is that using leverage is dangerous and you're seeing a lot of these people in this area that just like to use high leverage that's why if it moves you know thousand bucks one way or the other there's a good chance that you're just wiping out someone who's got like 10x on something uh, it's, right. it's, it's, take, take a quick guess in the past hour how many people you think got liquidated or how much money and which way in the past hour? Yep. Quarter of a million. You mean billion or a million? Million. I'm also cheating right now. I pulled up the liquidation chart. Oh, on okay. hey, I mean, that's that's more than a quarter of a million. That's a quarter of a billion. So you were looking at the data and got it wrong. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> the data is always wrong. Quarter of a billion. I was even wrong and I yeah, said yeah, it. This, I is, was just... this is wild now because, I mean, 24 hours, 444 million, one hour, almost you know, a third of that. Yeah. Roaring Kitty stream, man. A lot of leverage and low volume. That's how it happens. Quarter of a million. What an idiot I am. I was I meant to say billion. I meant to say th like three hundred million dollars. But uh yeah, I mean that's a huge that's a huge liquidation day for something that shouldn't be it shouldn't have been that volatile today. I feel like this should have happened over the weekend. Is what it is. Um, I'm sure we're gonna see a lot more liquidations in the coming months. Probably this weekend's if people start flipping too much, probably see the reverse of this come Monday, especially if we start going to that 75, 76K for Bitcoin. I'm going to tell everyone right one thing right now, and I think this might be your one thing that'll save your ass. There's a tool called the stop loss. It's a wonderful tool. If you're in the money and you know, you're afraid to close your position because you think that there could be more. There is nothing wrong moving your stop loss up a little bit each time, right? You're not going to, I mean, if you get liquidated, at least you've made some profit, but at least you're not going to be riding this thing fucking down all the way if something stupid were to happen. And that's not telling you to do that now. That's just me saying over years of trading, a stop loss has saved my life multiple fucking times. Can you attest to that? I mean, yeah, I think, I think that's always... Uh... You know, good good risk management advice. No one, no one your stops gonna be, no one your take profits gonna be. Let's put it this way. Alameda Research did not use a stop loss. They thought it was bad risk management. And uh that's literally a quote from Caroline Caroline Ellison. Might have might have added one or two words in there, but I'm paraphrasing for the most part. It's pretty pretty accurate. I've got nothing else really. I, I look at this market and I'm just not surprised by anything. I, I think it's it's up only until at least June 21st. I think that date is a very important date just for the markets. You know, summer volume's coming in and it's low as shit. We're already seeing that across the board. If you get people excited into the market, the buy and hold, the hodl mentality, you cut rates, you get everyone into the market. I can't tell you a better way to suck everyone in. And maybe it lasts a month, maybe it lasts two months until like September, like you're thinking, right? September, October. It's very possible. I just know that summer volume, extremely low. People aren't looking at the charts. Something bad happens, man. 
the algos are very dangerous out there. They will, if it gets past a certain point, they'll just sell fucking everything. That's a, that's a dangerous part in the market that we live in today. Right. Uh, maybe they'll halt something. They've, they've been halting to the upside recently. I don't know if they'll halt to the downside, but just kind of, kind of where we are in our, our mind space. Is there any final thoughts you got, dude, uh, before we wrap up this wonderful week? No, man. I think, uh, I think we uh, we had some good shows this week. It was fun hopping on here. And uh, yeah, just thanks for having me on. Hope everyone has a nice weekend. Absolutely, man. We're always glad to have you. I probably have to have you on a few more days. I got some work to be going to. So you can shoot the shit with J-Webb, talk about all of his elephant hunting in Kenya. We'll be back next week. I'm very excited. It's going to be a fun weekend, but at the same time, summer hours, guys. It's beautiful weather outside. Enjoy yourself. Take care of the family. To everyone that usually watches us, thank you guys for watching. We will see you next time. Take care. Have fun.